the top 10 power forwards of the 2022 NBA season. That's as much of an intro as you need. Let me get into the list with my two honorable mentions, and those players are Jeremy Grant and Julius Randle, two guys who have been solid this season, but are definitely having down years by their standards, specifically compared to the previous year. Neither of these dudes have been awful by any means, but the efficiency is just not there, the wins are not there, and I could not give them the number 10 spot over my pick, and I can't believe I'm saying this, Tobias Harris. This dude, every Sixers fan knows, He's been frustrating as hell this season. His efficiency from three is absolute garbage, only 31%, and as the dude who is getting paid max money to be the number two option on this team without Ben Simmons, he has absolutely been a disappointment. But at the end of the day, his efficiency is still significantly better than both Randall's and Grant's. His defense has improved in recent years, and his mid-range shot and finishing at the rim has still been good enough to keep him at the number 10 spot, even though he really has been frustrating to watch this year. At number 9, I am going to choose the eternally underrated, unsung hero of the Utah Jazz's incredible offense, Boyan Bogdanovich. This dude literally never gets talked about, despite being arguably the second best offensive player on one of the best teams in the Western Conference. Donovan Mitchell gets all the credit, people mention Mike Conley sometimes, and then Joe Ingles and Jordan Clarkson off the bench get a whole lot of talk, but Boyan Bogdanovich has been consistently a huge piece for the Utah Jazz for the last three seasons, and this is arguably his best one yet. He's averaging 18 points a game, and his shooting splits of 47, 40, and 85 are a big part of why the Jazz have been so good. He finishes well, he does the mid-range shots occasionally, and his three-pointers are just mwah, straight up money. The dude is a sniper. His defense is not there, which is what holds him down on the list, like he really is a bad defender, but on offense, the man does everything you could want from a role player. He is a great piece for this Utah Jazz team that is trying to prove they are legit contenders this season, and he's just played really good basketball despite no one talking about it, so Boyan Bogdanovich is my number 9 pick. At number 8, we have someone who has been in a whole lot of trade rumors this season and is very likely, in my opinion, to be sold before the trade deadline, and that is John Collins. The man is having the best season of his career, averaging 17 points and 8 assists while shooting incredibly from across the board. 54% from the field, 44% from three, and a decent enough 79% from the free throw line. John Collins has been a straight up sniper this year, while also being incredible at both finishing at the rims and as a lob target. While Clint Capella has clearly fallen off, John Collins has stepped up, and he's a pretty solid defender as well, even though he's more ideal on defense as a small ball five than a true power forward in the modern NBA, he does well enough on the perimeter. Not enough to make up for the fact that the Atlanta Hawks overall are a garbage defensive team, he's not going to carry you on that end, but he is definitely a positive on defense, and he really does deserve the money that he wants. I'm a little confused, to be honest, as to why the Hawks don't want to give it to him, but that's their thing. You know, they, we're, we're not going to get into that today, but John Collins has been a very good player. I think he's been better than Tobias Harris, Jeremy Grant, and Julius Randle, despite being known as more of a role player than any of those dudes are, and I have him up here at number 8 on the list. Coming in at number 7, I have the previous frontrunner when this season began, the frontrunner for most improved player, and that is Miles Bridges of the Charlotte Hornets. And while he has fallen much further down in that award ranking as the season has gone on, mostly because of his three-pointer regression, Miles Bridges has still been a really good player for the Charlotte Hornets this season, and you probably know because House of Highlights posts approximately 30% of all of their content as Charlotte Hornets content, and most of it is LaMelo Ball throwing insane passes to Miles Bridges. These two have fantastic chemistry, and this man is just really fun to watch get into the rim and posterizing people. But overall, his game's been pretty good. He's a little bit of an underrated playmaker, not elite by any means, 
screens, but four assists a game is solid. He's also given you 20 points and seven rebounds, and his field goal percentage of 48% is very nice. He's a real good finisher at the rim. He's crafty. He's got some like abilities to like double clutch and stuff. You know what I'm trying to say, right? He's really good at getting to the rim and finishing there. He's kind of like a poor man Zion, and that is not an insult to Miles Bridges whatsoever because we know how good Zion is, and he would be on the list if he ever freaking played this season. The reason that he is down here at number 7, when at the start of the season you could argue he was probably top 5, is the 3 point percentage. He's shooting 33% from 3 on 6 attempts a game, and that is just not cutting it. The man started out on fire, but he has seriously cooled off since then, and he needs to just stop taking so many 3s. Focus on what you're good at, Bridges, get to the rim, get those lobs, stop shooting so many 3 pointers, and his defense, while he hustles fantastically, is also not great, so he ends ends up here at the number 7 spot. At number 6, we have a player who surprised me a bit with how high he ended up making it, and that is Pascal Siakam of the Toronto Raptors, someone who is having I feel like I've said this a few times now in this video, but an underrated good season. And I think part of it is that he missed the start of the season and the Raptors were looking just really bad without him. But since he's come back and been playing with Fred Van Fleet, who's also been playing out of his mind, the Raptors have started to look like a legitimate playoff team in the Eastern Conference. They had a great win over the Bucks the other day and they are back in the play-in tournament. And Siakam has been a very big part of that. He's averaging 21-8 and five this year and shooting 48% from the field, 34% from three, and a not very good 72% from the free throw line. I'm not sure what's up with his free throw woes as he shot 83% last season on the same number of attempts, but the three point percentage is just good enough to keep the defense honest and the field goal percentage of 48% is pretty darn solid. He's a very good finisher at the rim and he just kind of knows his role. I feel like when Kawhi first left the Raptors, Siakam did become an all-star, but he wasn't ready to be that number one guy. He is starting to slowly go back into the correct role, where he is now sharing that responsibility with Fred Van Fleet, and it's really opening up his game and really showing you what he can do. Is he a true all-star caliber player? I'm not sure. I'm not sure if he's ever going to be that guy. But he has managed to be a very efficient scorer at the rim. He's a solid defender, and his playmaking has come a long, long way from what it used to be. So I have Siakam here, just outside the top five, at the number six spot. Now, up next, I have a player who I really considered having higher. Like, I strongly considered having this man at number three simply for his impact on the game, but at the end of the day, I just couldn't do it with the numbers he puts up, so I only have Draymond Green at number five on my power forwards list. And look, the stats are typical Draymond Green things. He's averaging eight points, eight rebounds, and seven assists, which I believe are a career high, 54% from the field, 29% from three, and 60% from the free throw line. And this dude's value is just, you can't tell from the stats. We all know that's how Draymond Green is. He is, in my opinion, the clear front runner for the Defensive Player of the Year award at the moment, as good as Andrew Wiggins has been, Draymond Green carries that team's defense, and you see it. He's out right now, and the Warriors are really struggling without both his defensive contributions as well as the playmaking he provides on the offensive end. He may not actually be the greatest passer in the world, but he plays the Warriors' system to perfection. His chemistry with both Steph Curry and everyone on the roster is great. He reads open lanes very well. Well, and maybe I, I might have to go back on what I just said. He is a very good passer and playmaker, a seriously underrated one, especially for someone who just doesn't score. But there comes the problem. Draymond Green as a scorer is just... He's just so bad, guys. He's just so bad. 54% from the field is nice when he's pretty much just getting open layups most of the time, but 29% from three is not keeping the defense honest whatsoever. And it's a big deal that Klay Thompson is now back because you really need to surround this dude with shooters. He is a complete non-threat from the outside, and I could also see it happening in the playoffs where if you're in a close game out of anyone on this Warriors team, you want to foul Draymond Green and send him to the free throw line because because 60% from the free throw line is just pathetic. And this is another dude where his free throw percentage has plummeted from recent years. He's never shot this low before. His previous low was 66%, and now he's shooting 597 
that's atrocious. He needs to get it together. But still, the rebounding, the playmaking, and the defense are phenomenal. So Draymond still manages to make it into my top five, despite his clear, massive weaknesses as a scorer. At number four, we have another dude who I really came close to having at the number three spot, but at the end of the day, I could only put Jason Tatum at number four because of his woeful efficiency issues. At first glance, right, you look at his basic stats, 26, 9, and 4 with a steal and a block. Jason Tatum looks like a very good NBA player, and I, let me be clear, he is a very good NBA player. I think he's still, like, probably a top 15 player in the league this season. But, when you look at his efficiency, 42% from the field, 32% from three, that's just not cutting it for someone who is taking this many shots. 21 field goal attempts a game for 26 points, that's pathetic. Those are some Russell Westbrook shooting splits right there from a guy who we expect to be a very efficient player. He has finally started getting to the free throw line more like we have been asking him to do for years, and everywhere else, his game has fallen off. He's taken these mid-range shots that are not good, his finishing at the rim is not as good as it used to be, and his three-pointers just can't fall. The man is taking a career high in three-pointers with a massive career low in three-point percentage. He's been a straight-up brick this year. It's very debatable that Jalen Brown has been the better player on the Celtics, and I just could not put Jason Tatum up at the number three spot ahead of DeMontis Sabonis because of these issues. Speaking of, I mean, I already spoiled it, number three is DeMontis Sabonis on my list, and I didn't think this dude was going to make it this high, but here we are. Despite the Pacers' struggles this year, I do not blame DeMontis Sabonis one bit. I want to be clear like that. Rick Carlisle is not using this man properly whatsoever, but he is, you know, toughed it out, He's playing still great basketball, despite being in a bad situation. He is currently putting up 19 points, 12 rebounds, and 5 assists, while shooting 57% from the field and 31% from 3. Now, is the 3-point percentage a good thing? No. 31% from 3 is not good, but this man is not a 3-point shooter. He is a good mid-range shooter and a great post-up player, and for some frickin' reason, Rick Carlisle has massively dialed down the amount of post touches that DeMontis Sabonis gets. He's taking three less shots a game this season than last season, and only averaging one last point because his efficiency is just that good. He's a great mid-range shooter, he's fantastic when he's allowed to get in the post, and he's just not given the chance. He's also a great playmaker out of the high post, which is why his assists are down, because again, he's not getting those post touches. I don't know why. I don't know what Rick Carlisle's logic is. If there is any, I don't think he's a very smart coach. But DeMontis Sabonis is a great player, and despite not being used properly, because we saw how he was supposed to be used the last two years, not being used properly, he is making the most of it, and he is still putting up fantastic numbers on a struggling Pacers team. I do not blame him whatsoever for this team's woes. I would love to see him once again get a coach who understands how to use him, and DeMontis Sabonis, for me, is at the number three spot. And finally, coming in at number one and number two, because they're pretty much tied for me. Like, I would, both of these dudes are top three players for this season right now, all right? With Steph Curry having fallen off, the top three players, in my opinion, this year, for the year as a whole, guys, not the last month, okay, LeBron James fans, the whole season, have been Nikola Jokic, Kevin Durant, and Giannis Antetokounmpo, and I really do don't know how to choose between these guys. Giannis is a far better defender while also being a phenomenal offensive player. 29, 12, and 6 are his stats. 54% from the field is just fantastic, but his three-point percentage, his free throw percentage, they're still not good, and I just don't know if the difference in offense between Giannis and KD makes up for the difference in defense, because I would say the defensive gap is larger, but offense is more important. Does that make sense to you all? Because defense and offense are not perfectly balanced. If they were, Matisse Thibel would be a clear all-star. You know, if he was an off, you took Matisse's defense to an offense, he'd be a clear all-star caliber player, but that's not how it works, because defense is not as valuable. I don't know. I don't know. Do I put Kevin Durant over him? I think gun to my head. I would rank Kevin Durant 
slightly above Giannis. So Kevin Durant is the number one on this list, averaging 29, 7, and 6, 52% from the field, 37% from three, 89% from the free throw line, while also being arguably the most clutch player in this season. I have seen so many games where Kevin Durant just carries the Nets back into it. He refuses to let them lose, and he just goes crazy. I really think they're going to struggle horribly with him out in this upcoming stretch of injuries, and the Bucks have been inconsistent with Giannis. So, I don't know. I don't know. I think that Kevin Durant has done a little bit more with a slightly worse team, so I am giving the edge here to Kevin Durant, but like, honestly, it's splitting hairs with these dudes. If you think it's Giannis, I'm not going to fight you on it whatsoever. These are two of the best players in the league right now. Either of them could very easily win MVP at the moment. It's looking like it's going to be a close race between them. Kevin Durant and Giannis Antetokounmpo, guys, the top of the power forwards list. There is such a large gap between them and num number three. No offense to Sabonis and the rest of them, but like, these dudes are incredible. I don't really know what to choose between them, even though I kind of just did. And that is my list.